Good morning and welcome to our April 16th second plenary session of the 2021 IUN forum. I want to pass it over to Sandy Runkle with Prevent Child Abuse America. Thank you everyone. We are so grateful that you are giving of your time and joining us this morning and you will be so glad that you did. Uh, I've had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Pruitt and I promise you all that you will be starting your weekend informed and inspired. Uh, we in Indiana can be a little extra proud too as uh, Dr. Pruitt is a Hoosier, which I just found out recently. Uh, he even graduated from Short Ridge High School here in Indianapolis. So again, a little bit of a, of a shout out there for, for Dr. Pruitt. Uh, as you all know, as I'm sure you all know, April is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And even though we want to lift up our children and our families all year long, uh, we hold April as, as kind of a special time in our work. And we cannot do that alone. We have so many wonderful uh, partners with whom we work. Uh, and we want to acknowledge them as well. The Indiana Department of Child Services, uh, the Kids First Trust Fund, uh, without whom many uh, prevention programs would not be possible. So we really are grateful to them. Uh, our local child abuse prevention councils all over the state. And I, I especially wanna give a shout out to Prevent Child Abuse Lake County. We're very grateful to them in their participation uh, with planning of this forum and of course, IUN, again, without whom this, this forum would not be possible. They've, they've done a, a lot of, of work and put in a lot of time and effort. And so we're so grateful to them as well. And there's so many other partners uh, that, that I, I can't possibly name, but to whom we are very, very grateful. Uh, we can't do this work alone. So there's still two more weeks in April. Please get out there with those pinwheels. Please make uh, you know, a special effort to, uh, you know, raise children and families, uh, check in on them, uh, provide resources. This is such an important time. So again, we thank you. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Kat and to Rachel. So without any further ado, um, Dr. Kaya Pruitt, which you just heard is from Indiana and is a Hoosier, is also a clinical professor, uh, was a clinical professor of child psychiatry at the Yale Child Study Center and the School of Nursing. He is a prominent author, international lecturer, media personality, and a pioneering researcher conducting the country's only long-term study of the impact on children of primary caretaking fathers. Dr. Pruitt is nationally known for his work with traumatized children and for research on how fathers influence their young children's development. Dr. Pruitt is an internationally known expert and forensic consultant on child, parental and family development, paternal involvement, children's mental health, creativity, and the effects of media, trauma, and divorce on children. He's the author of several award-winning books. He's been a columnist for The Good Housekeeping and Child Magazines. He's hosted his own lifetime television series, Your Child 6 to 12 with Dr. Kyle Pruitt. And he was chosen by Oprah Winfrey to host her award-winning video, Begin With Love and by Peter Jennings to appear with him on the Children's Town meetings after 9-11. Dr. Pruitt has the unique ability to share his medical knowledge and other information in plain English, which makes him highly sought after by the media, government agencies, and the business community. Dr. Pruitt inspires and captivates audiences of all kinds at the global level with a provocative, passionate style touched by personal warmth and humor. So in this session today, Presented in partnership with Prevent Child Abuse America, Dr. Kyle Pruitt reports on his years of study focused on whether engaging fathers improves outcomes for children. Welcome, Dr. Pruitt. Thank you. It's a lovely welcome. I, I'm, I'm going to work hard to live up to that one. Um, I'm very thrilled to be speaking to people who are making the difference in the lives of so many children from my home state. I. Um, I, I have a Chicago story I also want to start out with. When I moved to Indianapolis, I was seven years old. My dad had just taken over the pulpit at the First Baptist Church, and um, there was a Cub Scout and Boy Scout troop there, of course. So they, my parents thought it'd be good if I joined the Cub Scouts and kind of got 
my feet kind of wet with a, a decent group of boys. And so um, the first night that I went there, uh, I, we had went around to Lord through. I said, well, you know, I was born in New Mexico and I kind of spent my very short life so far in Kansas and rural places. <clears throat> and the, one of the older boys said, uh, uh, oh, and I, and I said, I was excited to be in a city like Indianapolis. And uh, the, one of the older boys said, you know, Kyle, Indianapolis is a city, but it's not a very big city. It's a cow town. And Chicago is a big city. You, you want to get to Chicago someday, but you probably want to wait till you're a grown up. So um, that really got me interested in what was going on in Chicago. Uh, and we finally made it up there, my brother and I, uh, when we were older. And uh, I've, I've loved my time both in Chicago and Indianapolis. I I've, I've, uh, also appreciate the special gift uh, that, uh, that Indiana gives to this country, it's kind of special blend of warmth and expectation. And uh, the idea that uh, we're gonna leave the world a better place is shared by a lot of Hoosiers and I'm, uh, I'm honored to be one of them. <clears throat> um, in my early conversations about this presentation today, um, Rick Hug and, and I had a chance to talk about sort of our experience with child abuse prevention, our role um, in the, the various parts of our professional lives. And he mentioned to me that you've got some forward thinking folks um, at the helm in Indianapolis and, and Indian, Indiana who are trying to change the conversation about child abuse, that we, we need to move from being mandated reporters to mandated supporters. And my, that really, that went straight to my heart, <laughs> right through my brain, because I thought it has been, um, I've been around long enough that mandated support, mandated reporting was seen as a very forward thinking way of uh, really pre uh, preventing abuse, uh, that we had to get the information uh, early and often about children who were in danger. And it was seen as a vanguard, really wonderful. No one anticipated the burden that it was gonna place on both families and uh, the mandated reporters and how it was going to affect their trust with, of each other. And it put the emphasis on punishment and not so much in the emphasis on help. And I love that you push through and you're, you're thinking about that. So I am here today to say that I support that completely. It makes a lot of sense. And it struck my ear <clears throat> the way I bet it did. It will a lot of people and they say, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we need uh, to think about not only using what we know, but how we go about using what we know with families um, whose kids are in trouble. Today, um, I'm gonna focus on a, a particular part of family service work that has um, caught my eye uh, over the 40, 50 years that I've been at this as a um, frequently missed opportunity. And I think that um, uh, we're gonna, have a conversation today about uh, the role that um, that fathering plays in the lives of children and uh, we're going to talk about it not as in opposition to what mothers bring but in in cooperation in a co-parenting model and mode. I want to start off with a somewhat surprising quotation from a very famous uh, person um, Margaret Mead, one of the great anthropologists uh, of, uh, of, I was gonna say yesteryear, but it, she hadn't been gone all that time. Look at that. I mean, not just the kid being held up in the sky, a lot of dads do that. But look at what she says. Um, that's not what I learned when I was in either college or medical school. Primary task of every society to teach men how to father. Uh, she didn't explain a lot of this. She just mentioned it in one of her talks about her studies of uh, families growing up um, in the South Pacific. And she, um, but I, it's, 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 it's perturbed me and it's got me thinking. And I wonder if she didn't mean um, they're not gonna learn it on their own or it's really good for a community to have nurturing men engaged or, um, they want to learn how to do it, but they actually don't know how. And so we need to support them um, because the children do not come from their bodies. There is no hormonal preparation, we thought. 
turns out that not true, but we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. So if that's the task of every society to teach men how to father, how are we doing in America? Let's look at the next slide. Not great. You all know these statistics. They're sobering. They're improving oh so slightly, but not fast enough for the well-being of our generations. This is particularly true in black and brown populations. Um, these numbers are not just black and brown populations, they're averages. So many of these numbers are worse in these highly challenged um, groups that we work with uh, in, in, in our life. Um, highlight a few of them, risk of poverty, behavioral problems, behavioral problems lead to school problems, school problems uh, lead to employment problems, employment problems, it's, it's just a tragic, uh, it's a tragic path. More likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, more, seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teen. Obesity, dropout, drugs and alcohol. So I didn't show this to you at the beginning just to discourage you, but just to say, okay, we are in this together, here's the issue. But there's a little something about this slide that I wanna correct the impression. This is talking about father absence crisis in America. And this is census data. And all the census data tells us is whether there is a father living in the home. It doesn't say whether there's a father in the life of the child. And you all know uh, that um, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of children, millions of children, have fathers in their lives with whom they do not live. And um, they, may not, they may know who their dad is. Uh, they may know where he lives. They may see him on the street. They may see him on the weekends. It may be, uh, it may be casual. It may be formal. But our research has been pretty sloppy about understanding the effects of engaged fathers outside of the norms of either the Census Bureau or of the marriage records. And so I want us to think very flexibly about, I'm not just talking about biological fathers today. I'm gonna to be talking about fathering. I'm not a fan of inventing new words, but every once in a while, because <clears throat> I think most of the old ones work pretty well, but the fathering is the act of bringing paternal care to a child. And that happens most conveniently when it's biological, but that's not the only way it happens by any means. Uh, and sometimes it's actually not the biological or a father. It can be a grandfather, it can be an uncle, it can be an older brother. Um, and in same-sex partners, it can be the other partner. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. What do I mean by involved dads? They feel responsible and responsive to their children. Responsive to their children. And emotionally, they take a kind of an emotional responsibility. They're concerned about their children's well-being. They're physically accessible. Their children know who they are. They may not live with them, but they know who they are and they can kind of get access to them if they need to. They're emotionally engaged. In other words, it's not just, I'm doing this because I think it's the right job. They're doing it because their heart is engaged and, and is, is taking delight in what it's like to care for another person that's, that is yours. Reliable providers, um, very important. A matter of fact, if men were making up this slide, that would be at the very top because, I mean, if men only were making up this slide because men tend to think that their most important contribution to the well-being of their children is their role as a provider. By the way, the children don't agree with them about that. The mother might, but the children don't uh, in particular. They want their dads uh, in their lives. Um, and that they have some influence in childbearing decisions, that they can help their partner uh, around medical and educational decisions, not just um, um, you know, buying uh, pampers on the weekend. Next slide, please. So, um, when I was in pediatrics and I was being uh, taught about things like attachment theory and how important um, <coughs> a close relationship was to the mother, um, I, I noticed there was practically no conversation whatsoever about fathers. 
and yet um, half of the parent population are <laughs> fathers. I had one. Uh, I was one. Uh, I was taught by pediatricians who were fathers. And, um, but they didn't talk much about fathering, partly because they were very preoccupied, uh, I think rightly so, with trying to help mothers do the best job they could. Uh, because we were in an era when we, we gave mothers all the responsibility uh, for how their children turned out. And that was followed very shortly by a period in which we gave mothers all the blame about what was going on with their children. <clears throat> so I tried to take a different perspective. How do children even experience men? Um, do they, are, is there anything different about the way that they engage? And I, I thought we would start that conversation by a very obvious statement that fathers do not mother. Uh, a lot of mothers wish they did, uh, but the fathers, when they try, um, it doesn't work. I studied uh, back in the 80s, a group of stay-at-home fathers and wondered, um, and the focus was, was on the developing competence of their children. I, for me, it's, research has always been about the bottom line, uh, where the proof of the pudding is child outcomes. It's not how well the father feels or how he does or his behavior. It's how well his child is doing. So the first thing I noticed in this population of men who were basically stay-at-home dads and there were poor men in there and there were middle-class men, there were welfare families in this group. Mothers not mothering because they were either incarcerated or drug involved and um, and the dad was, was staying with the children. What I, what I noticed was that these men fairly quickly stopped trying to copy what they thought parenting was from mothers. All of them had had mothers and they thought you were supposed to do it in a particular way. And they abandoned that model within months of trying it because they said, you know, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work in my hands. I don't, that goo goo ga ga stuff that, um, oh, let me hold you tight. Uh, make it, th that stuff doesn't work. I, I, I like to play a little bit more. I like to kind of get them going a little bit, and I like to have uh, a, an active interaction with them. And I, uh, and so very quickly, I noticed they were not mothering any more than mothers can father. Single mothers often try, and their children appreciate the effort, but they know something's not quite coming through here. That's why it's always been my advice to single mothers to bring in men they trust into their lives so that their children can really have that experience. Um, on the top of that, we, during that era where we were beginning to look at that, you know, perinatal and early year behavior became this uh, darling of research. And we began to be able to try to predict how children's health and competence would develop depending on how their life started. And so interestingly, let's take a look at how life starts for the parent, how parenting starts for the parent. Um, and an interesting study, completely accidental findings in a study of uh, familial thyroid disease in which uh, m children um, uh, who were in, who were, um, they, were, they hadn't been born yet. This was a, a prenatal study of families that had a history of thyroid disease. So the thyroid, uh, the endocrinologists were studying all the hormones that they could study in both men and women uh, prior to delivery, uh, around the time of the delivery and afterward. And to their amazement, they found hormonal changes going on in the men. And that was particularly true when the men were living with the women, but it wasn't exclusively true. There were women who were involved, but they weren't cohabitating. It turns out that testosterone goes down in men when they are becoming parents. Estrogen goes up, the so-called female hormone. Testosterone, we know, is responsible for reproductive confidence, but it's also a big problem with aggression and impulsivity. And so it's a good thing to have your testosterone go on when you've got to start paying attention to the needs of, uh, of an infant. And the most surprising of all, was an, a hormone called oxytocin. In women, it's responsible for preparing the breast for lactation and for shutting down the uterus after birth so that the mother does not hemorrhage. 
What is it doing in men? Well, it has another name. It's called the relationship hormone. And it's very high in, um, in all human beings when they are actually in puppy love or they're falling in love for the first time. Um, it's available online now in a little drop if you want to have a little hit before you go out for your next date. Uh, it doesn't work the way it says on the bottle, but it is called the relationship hormone for a reason. Oxytocin levels are through the roof on men when they become fathers. And what a great time to have your body shifting in a direction to pay attention to the needs of somebody else. And I've always thought that that might have been the reason why, you know, a dad moaning and complaining during prenatal classes, not showing up, whatever, in the labor and delivery, put that baby on his chest, give me, he said, God, I'd die for this kid. And it happens just like that. <clears throat> Another good reason to make sure that we can get as many men uh, into the labor and delivery back into the labor and delivery world uh, post-COVID as soon as we can. And we should be increasing their numbers anyway for all kinds of reasons. Another interesting thing about men and children, high incidence of paternal postpartum depression increases the risk for both mother and child. We now know that for every two women that are in a hospital uh, or under treatment for postpartum depression, there's one man, maybe not her man, but one man out there. So it's, it's only half as common in men as it is in women. And how often are we screening for it? How often do we look for it? Practically not at all, because we didn't know it existed. And the reason we need to be is because it's treatable. It's different than postpartum depression in women. Comes on a little bit later. And, um, and yet the father's untreated postpartum depression puts that child at risk and the mother at risk as well. Another piece of science that is that challenges our common knowledge about how children experience men. Father's vocabulary is a strong predictor than the mother's of language competence at three years of age. Yeah, and that's been, it was done at Duke and it's been replicated. And the researchers suggest that it has to do with the form of communication men use, which is that they don't use a lot of adapted speech. They often use fuller sentences and longer sentences. And how often do you hear a mother complain? Why are you talking to him like that? He can't understand you, won't remember, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the fathers give an explanation that they say, you know, they've got a, uh, baby talk isn't gonna get them uh, friends. And they need to know how this all sounds. Now they may not be conscious of that, but there's something in men that is driving them in the particular direction that you're gonna hear a lot of talk about today, which is how am I gonna fit into the world beyond my mother? Maybe that's my job. That's what a lot of men sometimes come to uh, eventually. And this funny little uh, finding of some toddler research, um, when a man is a good partner to his partner, uh, toddlerhood, tends to go a little better, uh, the age of no and the terrible twos. Um, and wouldn't we all love that to have, have, had, have happened to our young children? And I put, you know, common knowledge down at the bottom question mark. Of course, it's not common knowledge. I'd like it to be because it sets you up to think differently about a child's experience of men. Next question is, what about the evidence that children actually respond directly to men? Well, Interesting piece of work done by a pediatrician 20 years ago, Boston, split screen, mother picking up a six week old baby and the mother's face on one side of the screen, the baby's face on the other. And what do you see? Mother goes to pick up the baby. And the, the baby's heart and respiratory rates regularize, the eyes close a little bit, shoulders relax. Mom, great. Dad, same age, six weeks, goes to pick up the baby, and what do you see? Eyes open, shoulders hunch, heart and respiratory rates accelerate slightly as if party time, it's dad. We don't know that's what's going on, but we know at six weeks of age, there is something already at work in that child that is setting, preparing that child to interact slightly differently 
with the paternal than the maternal figures in their lives. Now think about the advantage to the child of that for a minute. Toddlers will use clearer behavior cues to their father. This often drives mom crazy. But since dads are less likely to finish their sentences and quote, read their minds and have the juice on the table instantly, the baby looks at the refrigerator, the father's more likely to stand next to the refrigerator as the toddler pulls on the door, ju, 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 and father's more likely to say, what do you want? Tell me what you want. And um, mothers get angry at that and said, all you're gonna do is frustrate him. But the father says, you know, I, he's got to speak directly. People aren't going to be reading his mind and warming his toast for him forever. Um, and finally, preschoolers use more advanced speech with fathers. Uh, that also gets under some mother's skins that they, they, they notice and that, um, <clears throat> that children will work harder, a little bit harder to get understood while mothers finish the sentences and get the needs met. Proof that children respond to, father, to fathers in serious ways is in this video, and I want you to look at it. It's from a study that Ed Tronic designed called Still Face. And the Still Face uh, experiment with mothers is run exactly the way it is with fathers, but for years it was thought to be exclusive to the mother-child bond because the mothers were um, supposed to be able to read their children um, because they're women. And we all know that parenting is on the job training. Uh, there's a lot of mythology about how, you know, you're raised to be a great one, but once you are one, uh, you realize um, that this isn't for everybody and it doesn't come second nature to everybody and it's tough for a lot of people all the, some of the time. So um, Ed decided to do it with a group of men and see what happens. And I want you to, to simply watch this video and, and learn from it. we've learned over the years is that babies are much more capable than we initially imagined, but they're also much more vulnerable. And in Edtronic's still face experiment, we get to see both in a very short period. We see the baby and the dad playing together in their routines. There are things that they know about each other and things that they do together and it's fun. And then we ask the dad to turn away and when he turns back to keep his face completely still and not respond to the baby. And the results are almost immediate and they're devastating. The baby looks to the dad and tries to get the dad to get back into those games. Hey, we were just playing just a minute ago, weren't we? We were having fun, what's going on? And then the baby starts to get frustrated when that doesn't work. So she'll have to look away and look around the room and find something else and then look back and say, now can we play? And within three minutes, the baby has really dissolved. She is trying to get out of the chair. She's uncomfortable. She's reaching out to dad. She's crying. And then we ask the dad to turn away again. And when he turns back, to go back to being regular dad. And it's a joyous reunion. They get back into their routines, the things that they do together, the things that they were just doing three minutes before. And the baby settles down and gets back to the comfort zone that she's developed with the dad. What we see in the still face experiment is how able the child is to initiate and be part of the relationship between the father and the child. 
but also how much she depends on that relationship in order to keep an even keel. And when she's grounded and comfortable, she can explore the world, she can meet new people, she can try new things, and she's got that safe base that she can always rely on. And there's a trust level there. We can only begin to imagine what it's like for babies whose life is like that three minutes all of the time. And they don't get that responsiveness and they don't get any help getting back to an even keel. And the results can be very tragic. They can have trouble trusting people, they can have trouble relating to people, and they can have trouble being calm enough so that they can explore the world and take part in the world. So we know that those initial relationships, that initial responsiveness and interaction between the father and the baby are keys to the baby's success as a child and as an adult. Every time I watch this video, I watch the children's um, post-reunion vigilance and uh, wondering and the, the intensity of their gaze right at their dad's eyes. Are you going to do that again to me? <laughs> I didn't like that very much. And how hard the children worked and what it's like if that father is on his cell phone or arguing with his wife or uh, having another beer uh, when that kid is trying to get something out of that man. So I've been talking a little bit about certain trends in behavior and I want to nail this down a little bit further and talk about distinguishing maternal and paternal behavioral trends and all I can do is call them trends and they come from about probably 300 different scientific studies from medicine, psychology, social work, um, anthropology, ethnography. And um, I think they're useful to review because when you hear about them, I think they're going to trigger certain memories that you've had and say, oh, I see what that is about. Um, and um, uh, I think, by the way, these are tied to role. I don't think they're tied to sex chromosomes. I, I think they're, they're not really gender embedded. And when we're talking about the, the roles that parents cut out for themselves in the lives of their children, um, those are the po more powerful influences, frankly, uh, than uh, what your reproductive competence may be. So half a dozen of things, I've broken them down. Prefer preference for activation and stimulation versus soothing and comforting. When a mother goes to pick up her child, um, you'll see nine times out of a infancy, nine times out of 10, you see the mother bend over, put the arms behind the child's back and bring the baby up to here, to just sort of, this is this area right here. And the mother often, if she's not too distracted, takes a moment of delight in what the way the baby feels on the body. And, it, and her heart rate goes down just like the baby's heart rate goes down. So it's a preference, in, preference for, for, for soothing and comforting. When a father goes to pick up that six or eight month old, what's predictable about it is that it is unpredictable. He may toss the baby up in the air. He may pick the baby up, roll them over in his hands, turn them upside down, put them into the, 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 the space next to his, his, his upper body and have the butt on the upturned palm. Um, more likely to be facing out, by the way, than facing in. And, um, you know, dads, will, I had a Texas dad tell me once, yeah, I like my, my kids, my horror, my hood ornament. And uh, like he wanted that to be the first thing that people saw about him in the world. He was, he was proud of his, his, his child that way. So, but the father has a, generally has a trend toward liking to be active and stimulating with his child. Fathers spend much more time with their children in play than do women. And that's true even if the father is the primary caregiver and has the dishes and the homework and everything else to do. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and also roughhousing, big difference between mothers and fathers. Mother, you've already had my body, thanks very much. You wanna play crazy, go with your dad. 
And fathers are often welcoming it because they haven't had that sensuous contact with their child. And the father, as Jungle Jim, is a very common stereotype across most cultures, by the way. Um, unpredictable versus regulating style. Fathers love to surprise and tease their children. Mothers like to calm their children down and settle them for the evening. Um, and understandable, uh, there's a lot on their minds and a lot on their plates. But when a father has a chance to really introduce a child to a novel circumstance, most dads are, are more than willing to do it. And we're gonna look at a video of that in a minute. Pl preparation for place in the world versus relationships. When a mother, um, I tell this story about I'm behind a checkout, I'm behind a woman at a checkout counter at a large grocery store, and her toddler is uh, emptying the gum and mints into the cart, all the ones they can read, because that's where they put them right there at the end. And she looks at her, at her I think it's about 28, 29 month old, put them back, we're not gonna take those. Um, I'm trying to get home, I gotta cook dinner, put them back. I'm not gonna buy them. And then she often exhausted, leans over, puts them back, tells the cashier, don't charge me. And then you follow her to the car and you hear, you know, you're not coming shopping with me again. All you did was just make that miserable for me. And, but the message is that so when you don't listen to me, you and I are not friends. We're not close. We're not emotionally connected when you are misbehaving. Father, hear the same thing. In the same circumstance, you'll hear, you won't hear the same thing. In the same circumstance, the father will say, put, put that stuff back. They send people to jail for that around here. And there's no point following him to the car because that's his, he said his piece, that's it. And he makes a comment that's not related to the emotional closeness that they have. The mother does, the father doesn't. Dads tend to emphasize, I'm trying to get you ready for a place in the world uh, beyond these relationships that you trust right now. Discipline, real world versus relational adaptation. That's a big trending difference. Frustration, tolerance versus facilitating. A balky preschooler who's just learned to tie their shoes, uh, you know, and is going to be late for school. And uh, they want to tie their shoes. They want to show you they can do it. Mom, come on, let's go. Got to go. Dad, um, let him try, let him try, let him think, you know. You're not gonna be tying his shoes for him in college. Uh, fathers tend to have, the, they, they don't get quite as upset by temper tantrums, we know that from the research. They don't get quite as upset uh, when children are showing signs of frustrations. Mothers move in immediately, and, or most mothers, and they want, the, they want that kid to be comforted and calm down, uh, probably because it's easier maintenance but also because they believe that's their role. Frustration tolerance versus facilitating. And again, I'm just talking trends here. You know some women who sound exactly like these, these men and some men who sound exactly like these women. So I'm, I'm not talking about a wholly inclusive view. I'm just talking about trends that might help us understand some of what's going on in co-parenting conflict, by the way, that's where we're headed. Different attachment behaviors at different developmental eras. This is very important to understand. You've all had some introduction to attachment theory, which is really all about the mother's role in helping a child feel comfortable and safe, that safe and secure base of attachment theory. Fathers have an attachment behavior that is not based on safe and secure base. It's based on, I'm gonna teach you something about where the limits are in the world. I have a toddler that uh, was described to me by a, by a Muslim father <clears throat> who had a big, of course, gorgeous beard. Um, he, would, he wasn't a toddler, he was a preschooler. Father would come home from work and the child would want to play with his dad before the supper and so they would get down on the ground. And he sank his fingers into the dad's beard and pulled as hard as he could and looked at the dad's face. The dad says, uh, ouch, um, Ahman, that hurts, let go. And so um, his being a preschooler, he doesn't let go, he holds on even tighter. And so he finally, the father takes his hands and takes them away from the face and says, don't do it again. We can play, but you can't do that. And of course, what's he do? He does it one more time. This time the father stands up and makes him go sit on the chair, go sit on the stairs 
and say, you cannot play with me. You have gone too far. You've hurt me. I don't want to play with you. And the child dissolves in tears as though, you know, wow, where did this come from? And of course, uh, what the father's doing, and he's, you know, I have to get him. He has to know where the edge is. When he goes too far, I have to teach him. I don't want him to learn that from the world. I want him to learn it from me. And um, that's an attachment behavior. And um, we're gonna look at a minute at a, at a video that shows not so much about negative, but about how men feel the responsibility to get their children ready for the world, particularly introducing them to novel experiences. Next slide, please. So uh, we've already covered this. Next slide, please. Here is a, a video, um, cute little video of a father who is introducing his toddler to the rain. Now we assume that the mother is uh, um, doing the, the filming, but I want you to watch this and particularly with the eye on the, the dance between the child's curiosity, the father's interest and the father's uh, deciding how to read how much the child can take. Well, Harper, do you want to go out in the rain? Do we go out in the rain? Why do we go? More? You want more rain? Okay, one more time. Here we go. Ready? I think the interesting things in this video for me are the moments in which the child is giving a slightly mixed message about whether enough is enough. And the father holds the child and watches pretty patiently until the child indicates that she'd like some more. But he does not override her. This comes back to being reactive. And any, any decent, sensitive parent can do that. But I wanted to just simply show you this because the, um, the emphasis, the trend toward novelty support um, for um, particularly a young child's interest in the world beyond the mother um, gets a lot of support from the dad, not competition, it's support. Um, and mothers are not often a fan of it until they really realize what's going on. And uh, that often comes later in the child's life. Um, um, by the way, I looked at some of the chat responses in the, uh, to the first video, and um, I, I think you really got the point, <laughs> the, the rapidity with which the event occurs, the intensity of the emotions that are happening between the infant and the father, and how similar this is to those of you who are familiar with the still face and the mothers. And uh, some of you are surprised at the intensity of the baby's reaction. And that's exactly what I wanted you to see um, when, uh, when we think of dads as sort of second class nurturers. I want you to remember how upset those babies were. This will probably be the most important slide I show you here. Um, and again, I'm talking about involved fathering. I'm not talking about biological fathers. I'm talking about men who have been uh, who are partnering often with their wives uh, or with their sometimes their sisters, sometimes their, their own daughters, uh, and uh, to really raise their children 
Um, and um, when the man and the woman or the fathering and the mothering are both present in the well-being in the, in the, the child's uh, really formative years, um, there are some really important outcomes for us to be aware. And I've broken them down into behavioral, educational, emotional. Um, and I, I have some references later in the presentation, which are tied to where this data came from. It's in the book that Marcia and I, my wife and I wrote in 2009. Um, <clears throat> behavioral, education, emotional. When fathering is involved, when you have involved fathering in the life of a young child, reduce contact with juvenile authorities. Why is that? Remember what the Muslim father said, I want to learn where the line is from me rather than from the world. So you learn where the limits are from uh, your dad more likely than from the state police. Delay in initial sexual activity. Here's something about being able to trust relationships. You're not looking for love in all the wrong places. And this is true for both men, for both boys and girls, by the way. Less reliance on aggressive conflict resolution. Um, dads and moms have different uh, approaches to, um, to discipline. Remember what I said about the real world versus the comforting? When you have had both of those, you've got a pretty broad repertoire of problem solving. That's a little broader than kicking or hitting or biting. Educational outcomes, higher grade completion and income. Who doesn't want that? How many doors open when you have higher grade completion and income? Math competence in girls, a little surprising, um, but not, um, but, and first uh, we had our attention drawn to this by some studies, uh, the first female um, undergraduates at places like um, MIT, uh, where their dads were seen as, as quite involved and they weren't all theoretical nuclear physicists. Some of them drove the T. Um, verbal strengths in boys and girls. And I, I guess the reason I think men think of their daughters when they're involved, they know them that there's more to them than just being a little princess or a little problem, that they have their own competencies and that they should, they deserve to have the support to be developed. Verbal strengths in boys and girls, um, and that's a very strong boost in literacy. And that's a surprise because we know the stereotype is that men don't talk much to their children. But when they do, uh, they use larger words and a more complete sentences. Emotional, greater problem solving competence and stress tolerance, greater empathy and moral sensitivity. Um, and most of these outcomes were observed by mid to late adolescence. And again, this is a, a, a composite, a mosaic of a, a variety of different research. So I just wanna leave that for a minute there up there because um, and this is, I, I believe my slides will be available on this site, but this is the most important slide up here. This is why we go to the trouble. Uh, this is why it's worth the trouble to engage dads, because it isn't easy to gain, engage dads. Many of you are already discouraged by doing it. You've tried it and it's failed, but we're going to be talking about how to go at that in a slightly different way. But it's not just the children that are changed. It's also the, it's also the fathering figures. Uh, uh, adult male outcomes have involved you live longer. I know it doesn't feel like that when you're doing it, but longevity increases, length of marriage, level of health is higher, and responsibility for relationships. Um, you'll hear from a lot of mothers and their mothers about how he changed when he became a dad, that he became more emotionally available to a lot of other people, not just his child. Accidental death goes down. Um, they sell their motorcycles or, or they're more careful. Um, they stop driving quite so fast. Uh, suicide goes down. Job changes are less frequent and aggression and impulsivity goes down. We've been looking at some very interesting research in um, areas of conflict around the world that when fathers are engaged in nurturing in their villages and communities, that there is overall a lower level of aggression and violence in the community as a whole. Something for us to be aware of as we look at how we want our communities to be functioning post COVID. So we're talking about the benefits of involved fathering. What predicts involved fathering? What's the single greatest predictor? The quality of the relationship with the mother of his child. 
or in the case of a, uh, a non-biological, the quality of the relationship with the mother of the child and who the, how the partnership works between the two of them. And if she thinks it's a good idea, it's likely to happen. If she doesn't, it's going to be extremely unlikely that it will happen, even in a marriage. We found this to be true in the research that we've been doing with Black and Latino families um, in California, indigenous families in Canada, um, Asian families in San Francisco, whether the couple was married, whether it's a single parent, whether it's a divorce circumstance, whether it's high or low income, whether it's a, again, whether it's a white or a non-white family. This holds true. The quality of the relationship with the mother is the gateway to uh, involve fathering. Here's how I want to spend the rest of our time together. On this problem, why don't dads come? Um, you all, you know, I would say that most of your agencies have thought a little bit about this. Um, but I have to say that in my experience um, at a national level, that the barriers to father involvement um, come down to a fairly significant lack of father friendliness in family serving agencies. Now it's often not done on purpose. Um, it's often done. Uh, it's, it, and it's just one of the reason, one of the things that I think get in the way of involved fathering. And we're going to talk at the end of the presentation about how to address it. Um, there are an awful lot of women in the child service agencies who have had very negative experiences with men and they're anxious to sort of save their, <laughs> their, their clients from that and um, have not taken the perspective of the child who is hungry for a relationship with the father, um, which seems like uh, not a very important component when you're thinking about safety and the well-being of the child. So it all has to be balanced. But we'll get back to talking about father friendliness and how to improve it. But I want to look at some of the other barriers, <laughs> personal barriers. Um, incarceration, enormous, especially unnecessary incarceration, of which there is an enormous amount. Mental health issues, um, depression in fathers, um, anxiety, mostly depression, substance abuse, huge inter barrier, intergen intergenerational issues around fathering. How often is a father in jail with his father? Um, and I know in New York and Boston, I assume in Chicago, it is startlingly high numbers. And or the father's just not ready to be a parent. He's a teenager. Or he's never been able to think very seriously about the needs of other people because he hadn't had his own needs met. Other barriers, <laughs> geographical separation. Um, this can happen, you know, if a father has, a, um, has been in Afghanistan. Uh, by the way, where this picture was taken. Um, physical distance or in separation in divorced families. Um, domestic violence, uh, another kind of desert uh, that is a hugely important familial barrier uh, to, to being an involved father. But I would remind you that domestic violence can go both ways and that the more serious nature of it is in the hands of men but the frequency in which women are the perpetrators in domestic violence is something that we are beginning to appreciate. Um, maternal gatekeeping, um, familial barrier, very common across all of our socioeconomic groupings. The mother is feeling like it is her job. She's born to it. Her family treats her as though her children are her responsibility forever. And that um, she has figured out certain ways to make the children's lives work. And so she makes a decision that it's her way or no way. And that the father's contributions are problematic and, um, and in competition with what she's trying to achieve. And so she has her, she's got her hand on the, on the lock of the fence around that child. And I think we see a lot of maternal gatekeeping. Um, it's, it, it's almost in all families. Um, but until you become aware of it, you're not aware that the father is feeling uh, the, the marginalization that you accuse him of 
is a marginalization that he's never been able to figure out how to get around. His interest in, for example, roughhousing, his interest in the fact that he doesn't deal quite the same way you do with frustration, that he disciplines slightly differently, that he holds the child, talks to him differently than you do. Those are within the norms of the maternal, maternal behavioral variation. And they are not negative contributions to the well being of the child. But until the mother understands that the child's well being can be improved by the fact that he's doing it slightly differently than she is, she's likely to continue to feel like this is her territory, her job, her responsibility. So that's why I lead in this presentation with knowledge first. And so that we can begin to think a little bit more about loosening the grip on the fence around the child. Um, in maternal gatekeeping. Next barrier, societal barriers. Organizational barriers. The physical environment. <laughs> I've had men tell me, you know, I went down to that clinic and I felt like I'd walk, walked into the women's room. Pictures on the wall, there were no magazines for me. I couldn't even find a big enough chair for me to sit in. And, um, you know, they treated me okay, but I didn't feel like I belonged there. There weren't any sign, there weren't any magazines I was interested in, and all the artwork were pretty frou-frou pictures of women with their babies. Hours of operation, obviously. If you're only open during working hours when men are more likely to be working, then, um, and don't offer any kind of alternative, you've already announced that you're not a very father-friendly. Lack of male staff members, a big problem in the child service area. And men do feel more comfortable if they see, you know, a guy driving the bus or somebody in the uh, male staff member um, and exclusive commitment to mothers um, and exclusive is the problem with that that when you're um, e even WIC programs uh, can be very father inclusive even though the father's not in the name of the program funding resources policy staffing all organizational barriers societal barriers punitive child support policies and, po and policy disincentives you all know about these, uh, despite some of the reforms recently, you know, the, the joke was that if the welfare worker saw a man's shoes in the closet, you didn't get your benefits. There are versions of that still out there. Lack of males in social service staffing and administration, support of maternal gatekeeping, which is often inadvertent, and social science and health delivery systems exclusive focus on the mother-child diet. I think there has been a problem. We have learned a lot focusing exclusively on attachment theory, but we have marginalized half of the parental population by doing so. And the children are paying the price, not the mothers. Actually, the mothers are also paying the price because they're picking up all the work that the father could contribute if the, uh, if the gatekeeping was not so, so rigid. Positive co-parenting. Co-parenting, is where all this, my, my research on fathering has led. It's not about father advocacy. I think fathers are grownups, they can advocate for themselves. I'm interested in the bottom line, how it affects children and how children are raised in a co-parenting context. And again, I'm not talking about white picket fence, two homes. The 33% of American families that have, all, all, always, that have always been idealized. The 67% is where the rest of us are, uh, mixed, blended, uh, extended, um, sometimes big, messy, sometimes small, lonely, but positive co-parenting when the mother and father can tag team. They're not, they're not, they're not clones of each other, but they can tag team to raise their children. When one's had enough, the other one can step in. When one's overstepping the disciplinary, the other one can step in. When one just doesn't want to do any more play, rough housing, or adventure, they're just, they're, 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 they're just kind of worn out. Co-parenting, what is it, the advantage of doing it well? Parents cope better with the demands of the infant who, by the way, becomes less fussy when co-parenting is more positive. Infants show increased emotional and physiologic regulation. They eat better and sleep better when moms and dads are not in conflict. Children have more access to both parents. They're less likely to be caught in the middle of disputes. The parents are more confident in their parenting and have better communication with each other. Um, it increases the availability of support, both at Manchel and in our research, we've seen incomes go up, even though there's no job training in the kind of uh, supporting father involvement that we do. Um, 
postpartum depression goes down. The insurance companies should be very happy about that. Facilitates father, the parent's psychological adjustment and promotes a sense of competence, even amongst the divorced parents. So I think positive co-parenting is the gold standard that I'm looking for. Uh, and I think if you, and when you talk to children, that's what they want. Of course, they want a happy mommy and a happy daddy, but they also want a happy place to grow up. <clears throat> so by not including dads in any of the problem solving, we're, we, we've got one eye closed. And so consequently, we can't see uh, what the child sees. Zero to three, an organization that, that um, is, uh, it's the National Center for Infants, Toddlers, and Their Families, and a wonderful organization full of great resources for people who work with younger families. Uh, they do surveys every 10 years or so. They get some money from some corporate sponsor and they go out and do it. And they recently surveyed American parents uh, with a uh, um, extra sampling of, um, of black and brown families. And this is what fathers in that survey spoke up. This was an internet survey, 1500 families. Need respect for their competencies and unique contributions. They would really appreciate it. They're not getting any currently, both from each other and from their partners. Men aren't supporting other men very well either in this e effort. Need targeted educational efforts to raise their understanding of the kinds of experiences that promote healthy. We're not doing a very good job, Margaret Mead. We've let her down. We're not teaching. This doesn't come up. We don't teach parenting in high school to boys um, in, a, in a way that's useful to them. Uh, we you know, talk about uh, pregnancy prevention, but we don't, we don't talk about parenting in ways that are helpful to them or even prepare them to ask the right questions. So men are speaking up and they're saying, I need to know more about my child. I need to know about my milestones and I need to have my job respected. How do you engage dads in your programs? And I'd like you to think about, while I'm going through this list, I'd like you to leave this, um, I'd like you to leave this event today with an idea, and I wanna see some of them in the chat, of one thing you would change about the agency that you are work, working in, a simple thing that would improve father friendliness. Um, and here are some of the things that we, um, that we know have worked uh, in a variety of different settings. Addressing maternal gatekeeping, both domestic and institutional, and engaging fathers positively. Acknowledge the, uh, um, the trend and the obligation uh, that your uh, institution has felt to focus on the needs of mothers and um, what could you do to, um, to loosen maternal gatekeeping on the way that you go about your business? Secondly, men feel engaged in programs that address their needs. Um, how do they help um, breastfeeding mother? How, um, you know, my job is shaky. Uh, can you put me in touch with somebody that could help me get a job that would support my family better. Um, could you help me think through what my responsibilities are with her? Could you, could you help us do that together? Because I think we're in a little bit of conflict about it and I just back away, I wind up doing nothing because she seems so unhappy. But what could we do? Could you help us do this together differently? We got dads involved at very high rates um, of, uh, compared to other father engagement programs and research by asking explicitly, hi, I'm Kyle Pruitt. I'm part of a program that's engaging uh, fathers and mothers in their young children's lives to see if we can help things go better for them. And I would like you to be there 8.30, 9.30, whatever the time was, and we'll be looking for you. Uh, and if you can't come, uh, don't just send your partner. We, we really need you, okay? Um, and then if he doesn't show up, you call him. You don't go ahead and meet with the mother because you've already pulled the rug out from under your own father friendliness activity. Asking explicitly was the one thing we heard over and over again. Well, you asked me. You know, no one ever asked me to come. 
um, uh, you know, I'll come with you to the pediatrician and I'll do what all the things you want me to do. But when the agency asks explicitly, they are more likely to be successful. Using local male talent, cultural competence, we found more similarities than differences um, in, the, in, the, in the multitude of cultural settings in which we have studied fathering. And finally, don't forget prevention. Parental leave, breastfeeding, depression screening are all ways in which we can reach out and engage dads at the times that they are most likely to be meaningful um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the lives of their children. Now, how do you feel about this? Does this hit your eye slightly differently than it did 40 minutes ago? I hope so. Well, thank you for your attention. I'm gonna look at some of the Q&A, but I know I've got, I've got some wonderful moderators who are gonna help me focus on some of the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pruitt, for that presentation. We do have some questions in the chat. If the father was stoned or if the father was drunk, uh, how would the still face experiment go? Mm -hmm. Not very well, uh, because um, if you're compromised, if your attention is compromised, you can't be sensitive to or respond appropriately to somebody else. So you're, I, I don't know that you would get so much an upset child as you would get an, a disengaged looking around for something else, because, you're, because the father, um, the same thing would be true for a mother, uh, would not be responding to the cues. And you have to be on your toes to pick up those cues and respond. You know, the, um, the, the sort of Latinx looking father who had the giraffe and was bouncing it back and forth and had, you know, he was so cued into what his daughter wanted next, uh, when to let go of his, of his fingers, when to follow the, the giraffe across. You're stoned, you're drunk, uh, you're strung out, you're not paying attention to those things. So I, I, that would be my answer to that. Um, we have a comment. It is so interesting to think so many children have been brought up without a father in their life. Um, I wonder if this has something to do with the cognitive development and why it seems like there are so many more children who have disabilities in our era. Great question. Uh, it's a double header. I'll take the first one. Um, there are, you know, as you saw on that third slide, there are millions of children that have grown up with fathers absent from their homes. Doesn't mean the father's been absent. And uh, very often, um, you know, I, as a clinician, I would listen to presentations of cases and I would hear uh, the social work say, and the father's not engaged, okay? And so we're gonna work with the child, blah, 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 and the mother. Three sessions into the work with the child, I hear that the child sees the father every Saturday and every Wednesday, he knows where the father lives. He knows who the father's new girlfriend is. He, uh, his dad comes to see him at his games. So that father is very involved. And if we don't reach out to him to support the mother in what they're doing, I mean, you obviously have to become, you have to, have to be sensitive to conflict. Um, I, I can't say causally that I think paternal absence has or the relative paternal absence in America as a result of economic and poverty and societal and all those other barriers I mentioned are responsible for the number of kids that we see in this country that are out of control or depressed. I will tell you that I believe strongly in the prevention of value of engaging the dads. And we do see in our research, 1100 families studied over 10 years, um, high risk, we saw domestic violence go down, we saw substance abuse go down, we saw aggressive behavior in children go down, and we saw school we saw school performance go up. So I do know that when you reverse the trend, you get a positive effect. But I think there are so many other things, so many other variables that are pressing upon our children right now, everything from nutrition, environmental toxins, uh, the country's um, very confused uh, response to, um, to COVID, um, our, our lack of really strong um, ethical and spiritual leadership within the recent years, 
we've really cut a lot of our kids loose in the wilderness. And I think a lot of them are upset and showing us how they're upset that way. I do know that when you've got couple, two parents involved with you, you have a protective system that's likely to be a, an insulation against some of these other troubles. Um, we have, I'm a single therapeutic dad. So my question is more about how I can help meet the needs of my sons for mothering, given that we, they do not have one available in their lives. I know that there are gaps. Um, I'm going to answer that question for both single mothers and single fathers. Um, the value of bringing into the lives of your children um, men or women that you trust uh, within your family and to uh, allow your children experiences with someone who is different than you um, and has different talents and different needs and making sure that your home is open enough or that your nurturing setting is open enough to invite these other important people into the life will help bring about some of the effects that I'm talking about. And um, you'll hear from children that, um, you know, they only generally feel safe with the people their parents trust. Uh, I mean, until they're teenagers. Um, but during the formative years, it's very important that you have a that you have the, your community support and that that can come from church, from school, from the neighborhood, uh, from your own extended family. And I hear many single parents who feel like I have to do everything. It's all up to me. I'm so exhausted. And um, we, we talk about, well, who who's in your circle of friends? Who could you trust to ask, you know, to join you for a half hour or to take your kid out for a walk or to um, in the post COVID days? Uh, take them into a, a slightly different part of the world than you would normally go um, and to ask. And I would encourage members of the community to respond positively because I think that decreases the loneliness um, and increases the possibility of a child having multiple experiences that they can then use as a platform. With that, we do have another question. The I hate my ex more than I love my child intentional gatekeeping is so difficult to overcome. Do you have any suggestions for how to guide a mother in acknowledging the importance of a, the father in a child's life? Um, a little knowledge is a really helpful thing in this, in this area. Many emotionally conflictual relationships like that obliterate the needs of the child. I'm so angry about X, Y, or Z, or about their new life, or their new partner, or they don't pay their child support. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make sure they don't enjoy uh, access to my child. Um, what's missing from that conversation is the child and the child's desire and hunger. Most women do not understand the stricter they are with that the stronger the hunger will grow in that child for a relationship with that guy. And when that child can walk, they often will walk. And they're in search for that, rela they're, they're, they're gonna search for that relationship. So we work all the time to support mothers to sort of, you know, we know how important your mothering is to your child and how important your child is to you. If you were in that position uh, that your child is now in, and I eliminated the father from his life because I'm so angry with him. Um, you think, how would that affect the child? And often the mothers have said, well, that's exactly what happened to me. My mother cut my dad out of my life because he was a jerk to my mother. And they had never thought about the different outcomes. And so I think support for putting the child's needs on the same table as your own emotional needs will allow you to start to address the things you could tolerate and the things, the things that you can't. But we have seen enough that when we tell a mother, the stronger you prevent access to that, that guy, if he's, if he's safe and you think he's safe, uh, I know you think he's a jerk, but is he safe? And is your child safe with him? 
uh, then you're going to cut down on that hunger to leave you and go find him, which is coming. Developmentally, it always comes. So that would be my advice. Um, so how does an absent father, uh, specifically in prison, affect the toddler um, when they've had the opportunity to interact with the child during infancy? Um, you know, early experience um, changes both of you. It changes you, you bi it changes your biology, not just your behavior. Um, remember what I said about hormones and that child is taken into the father's heart early on and, um, and generally never leaves. And so when the father has to be absent for a, a military posting or um, an illness or whatever, and has to disappear, uh, when there might be uh, some reunion uh, time required when the father re-enters the child's life. Um, toddlerhood is a tough one to come back into because, um, you know, toddlerhood is about me, myself, and I. It's, uh, it's about what I want and who I am and what I need. Um, and um, so I, if you're not here to meet my needs, uh, you know, who are you and what are you doing? That's what toddlerhood's about. So if you've had the, the foundational start, um, then your child will be very happy to have you back. They, you may have to pay a little price, but it'd be very happy to have you back. And it's, it's worth, uh, you know, certainly don't use it as an excuse to stay away, um, as some men do. You know, he's lost contact with me and I don't want him through the pain of losing me again. Uh, there's not a child I've ever seen that would say, oh yeah, dad, that makes sense, stay away. Um, okay, we have just a few more questions and then we are going to wrap it up. Um, which one you may not be able to answer, do kids do better with their father than their mother? And I think that that kind of goes into an opinion, depending on the parent, but. Um, I guess the best answer I would give to that is uh, maybe. Um, there are, you know, what the, the most important thing in being a competent parent, um, it's one word, it's not a whole list, it's sensitivity. And do I get your needs and do you get you know, can I figure out what you need and get it for you, get it to you, or help you get it yourself now? So sensitivity is not tied to sex chromosomes. It's tied to other things like my, like one's personality, one's own uh, emotional uh, framework and well-being. And um, experience helps, but it does not guarantee because you can be an extremely sensitive parent and not be with your child 24-7 uh, or even 8-7. Um, but if you have the sensitivity, <coughs> parenting, competent parenting is, is, is measured in sensitivity, not hours spent with. I mean, we have this tragic data that the, the number of infants um, who die at the hands of their mothers uh, it did not, uh, it did not happen because it, it, it happens with mothers who are with those infants 24 seven. That's part of what, that's part of what the, has, has rendered the mother so helpless and so angry that she feels like she has to end this life. So time does not lead to sensitivity. Sensitivity is a trait. And I think for most parents, um, you know, as a father, do it, do a better job than a mother. Maybe on a camping trip, maybe, but, um, or maybe dealing with uh, an upset principal, but does a mother do a better job than a father um, with um, when your feelings get hurt on the playground and, um, or when you lose a really good friend or somebody trashes you on the internet? Um, there's plenty of jobs to do, plenty of jobs to do well. So I would never, uh, put a male versus female as a who does a better job. Okay, so our final question is, 
How likely is it that the lack of equal opportunities for minority men creates the lack of allowed fatherly participation by mothers in the frequency of crime and other poor societal behaviors? So for example, mother being pestered into allowing the male child too much unsupervised freedom in his formative years. Pestered by whom? What do you think, Kate? I believe that they in, mean pestered by the child due to the father being absent is how I interpreted it. Um, so the mother maybe feels some sort of guilt by the absent father. You know, that's more of an observation than a question. And I think it's a great observation um, because I see, that, um, I see that dynamic played out an awful lot. And that's why, you know, child support and family support agencies need to be making sure that they're talking with that woman about this particular problem and not simply saying, you know, he's not around or he's just a problem. And then focusing only on her relationship with the child. It has to do with opening a broader window in our own work with our families. And then I think in five years, we'd have a better answer to that question. But I do think the questioner has put together a trail of vulnerability that I think is quite credible. All right, and that is all of our questions that we have for today. I just wanna say thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate your presentation. Uh, we had really good comments about the information that you shared. And some people were concerned a little bit about some gender biases that were uh, being discussed. Do you have any comments or final comments about the roles of men and women when it comes to the work that you're speaking of? As I said in the presentation, I'm more convinced that, uh, that women and men feel trapped in the roles that they have rather than by the gender that they have, um, they have been assigned at birth. And I do think there are obviously, I've, I've talked about stereotypical behaviors, and stereotypical behaviors are things that we study and that we watch uh, evolve and affect our, our children and the well-being of our families. And um, I, I, I don't think it advances the field or the well-being of our children to assume that they don't matter. Uh, they do. And they, are, they matter because they've been embraced by society and given values and people are trapped in them. Part of what I'm really, my work had been about is to untrap those mothers and those fathers um, from the roles that the societal barriers have given them. So I think, um, you know, let's, let's be thoughtful about the language we use, but let's also be thoughtful about the children's experience and what they need to be hearing from us and the help they need to get what they need from their parents. I don't think that changes. So I, I really appreciate the Q&A and I appreciate the questions and I, I appreciate the, the appreciation and the challenges. Uh, this is, we're in a new era that requires a wholly different and I think very liberating form of conversation about the well-being of our families. And I, I appreciate being part of that, Dr. Harris. Thanks for having me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Peru, for joining us again. We really appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Catherine, for facilitating for today. And thank you to all of our attendees that joined us. Again, Dr. Peru, thank you so much. And everyone have a great day. Thank you.